Joining us now to discuss markets and his expectations, David Bonson, he's founder and CEO of the Bonson Group. David, thanks so much for being here. Now, in terms of, I suppose, what we got out of the jolts, what we can expect from the Fed, do you think that there's going to have to be, or perhaps a catalyst might come to light, but in terms of the Fed not going 25, what's it going to take for them to just press pause and just, just relax a little bit considering all the volatility? Well, it's very difficult to be able to separate what they ought to do from what they will do. Um, it's simply unfathomable to me that they would hike another quarter point. Um, but that is not because just purely the data is suggesting they could break something. It's because there is no benefit to what they're doing. It is not a counter to inflationary pressures. And in fact, they already on an annualized basis over the last six months have seen that inflation rate come down to the level where they need it to be. They know the inflation rate has been dropping precipitously. And if it weren't for the lag effect in CPI on shelter, they would be there. So as far as what the Fed will do, as you can see in the futures market, it's very unpredictable, roughly 50-50 chance of one more quarter point. Uh, but I believe the more they end up tightening, the more violent they will have to be in cutting rates later, once again exacerbating a boom-bust cycle. All right. So, so, David, what's your sense right now? How are you, you know, working with your portfolio in order to insulate it from uh, the expected volatility that might hit us down the road? Well, we're not so much interested in insulating from volatility. We expect as equity investors that there will be volatility, but we want it to be smart volatility. We don't want it to be up and down movement because we're in speculative or unpredictable investments. And so we focus on cash flow generation. We really like the dividend growers of the marketplace because we think they're going to give us a better business model and certainly a higher quality holding in an, a period where you have fiscal and monetary and geopolitical reasons to be concerned. And so quality uh, is going to rain out. And, and in fact, we believe that there remains a big disconnect between the valuations and the growthier parts of the market and those that are, are more value oriented and certainly uh, with a bigger focus on return of capital to shareholders. What do you make of uh, the VIX being at 19 amid all of what's happening? I know, uh, you know, we've been discussing and Will has been highlighting how the forwards contract indicates there's still some bearishness uh, going into the second half of this year. But for the here and now, how do you see the fact that equities uh, and the fear gauge is reflecting that equities are actually quite calm? Well, I think it's a contrarian indicator that generally we like equities a lot more when the VIX is in the high 20s than we do when it's in the high teens. But it's been a very bad sentiment indicator for a long time. And part of it is that it is so heavily, heavily owned now by retail investors that it's lost a lot of its predictive value as a contrarian indicator. But I agree with you that at 19, it doesn't seem to be indicating a high amount of fear. And I think it has mostly to do with people front running the Fed, that they believe that the Fed is going to be pausing and in yeah. fact, by the end of the year, cutting rates. Yeah, I, I think there's some of that uh, into the market sentiment as well, because it, I mean, even if you go by history, uh, it's, it's seldom that if the market expected a big recession or more volatility or perhaps uh, a more, uh, higher rates, going forward, a more hawkish Fed, that it would be this calm at this stage. Uh, David, uh, you know, let's talk about energy companies because they're back. Uh, I, I can't say with a bang, but you are seeing traction there as well uh, because of what's happening with oil prices uh, and our strong dividend plays. Do you like them? Well, we certainly do, and we like them for more than just one week's price action. Um, even when it was up over 50% last year and uh, in the 40% range the year before, you were still dealing essentially with a sector of the market that is undervalued historically, that has substantially delevered, much less uh, debt uh, that they are dealing with relative to cash flow, relative to assets. 
And then on the midstream side of energy, far too few people ignore the pipelines that are necessary to transport oil and gas. Everyone is so focused on the E&P, the production side upstream. Uh, there's a lot of operating leverage there, and there's great cash flows. But we think the midstream also offers a really defensive way to play energy. David, I've got to ask you, in terms of energy, and I suppose, you know, this expectation that we are going to see pricing absolutely surge in the second half, all centred around the demand story, can it not be read in a different way that, you know, what OPEC realistically is trying to, or perhaps they know something we don't know in terms of their own demand expectations, that we could see demand crumble in the second half? And you, you look at something like even just nat gas, for example, and I know the Henry Hub's a completely different story, but in terms of this expectation that we are going to see upside coming through that just might not be there. So then how does that parlay into investing into energy companies right now when you, you could see a downturn coming in terms of their, their profitability in the second half? See, this isn't a demand story. It never has been. It's a supply story relative to the fact that there is inadequate production even if you had constrained demand. I don't know if China is going to add a million barrels a day of demand by the end of the year, as was initially predicted with the COVID reopenings. But even if it underwhelms expectations, which it certainly is so far, the fact of the matter is that the break-evens in U.S. production have all come down substantially. For pre-existing wells, they're making money in the Permian at $30 a barrel, let alone 50 for new wells that were to come online, they're making money at $55 a barrel. So even if demand underwhelms, the supply is just far too low. That's exactly what OPEC Plus was saying. And the U.S. has refused to take on its role as the marginal producer. David, you know, this is an interesting conversation and uh, let's just carry it on into the next segment. Welcome back to the street. JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon telling shareholders that the fallout from the banking crisis is not yet over, increasing the chances of a recession. And he's predicting more market jitters and tightening financial conditions as banks become more conservatives with loans. And we're back with David Bonson, founder and CEO of the Bonson Group. And I have to ask you, David, look, <laughs> It's a really tricky situation because you've got all of these regional banks that have very different conditions than the majors, the, the likes of the, the JP Diamonds or Jamie Diamonds of the world and Goldman Sachs are facing. Do you think that he, he, it has merit what he's saying that, you know, we could see a, a raft of second order impacts continuing to flow through, especially as it relates to not only credit conditions, but the, the CRE markets, for example? Well, I think that generally speaking, when you find that everybody is talking about something, it is very rare that that becomes the catalytic event. <laughs> and I have never seen uh, more people pile on a discussion about the inevitable problems in commercial real estate than we're seeing right now. And that gives me a great deal of skepticism that will e it will end up playing out as negatively as some predict. I think everybody is well aware that there will be some distress in some parts of CMBS. Delinquencies are still very, very low, both on the CMBS side and bank loans. And it's mostly isolated to certain aspects of the office and retail lending. Mm. Multifamily okay. is very robust. Industrial is very healthy, almost minuscule levels of default. Some banks are going to need to roll over their um, mm. loans as those maturities that are floating as the rates that are floating come due, and the lenders are going to work with those people. So I do not expect CRE will become a major catalytic event. And I think ultimately a lot of banks are waiting for their deposit foundation to become more steady when they don't have to compete with money markets that are offering triple or quadruple the yield. Uh, let's play the reverse then, because basically what you're suggesting is because everyone's talking about it and suggesting it's the case, that that isn't the likely circumstance. But what about the consumer right. then? Because everyone's, including Jamie Dimon, yet again today, is trying to say that the consumer is requisitely strong. Could that be what cracks consumption, considering that so many underlying indicators are reflective of the, the pressure that is starting to build? No, because the consumer in the U.S. never stops spending until they run out of credit. <laughs> And, and that's all it ever comes down to is do they have access to credit? Jobs are frankly too plentiful. Wages are too robust. I don't care if the consumer slows down because they're saving a little bit more. I would love it. 
but everyone who's obsessed with the consumer continuing to shop and spend more money, the fact of the matter is that that needs to be a credit conversation, not a consumer appetite conversation. Every substantial slowdown we've ever had of consumer spending and demand in our country has been from a decline of credit. Indeed, indeed, David. And, you know, it's an ongoing debate. One will have to see how things pan out. Uh, you like a fair bit of health care. I'm looking at your stock ideas, whether it's Gilead Sciences or MetLife or, for that matter, even Johnson & Johnson. Walk us through some of your thoughts. <clears throat> right. Those are a few sample names of great dividend growers. And I happen to pick Johnson & Johnson and MetLife because they're a couple of the names that are actually down year to date. And certainly people always love buying at a lower price. MetLife, like some of the other financials, had got hit rather hard in the first quarter. And there's that issue about how the net interest margin and impact of rates moving would affect a life insurer like MetLife. We've owned it a long time, and we can see with the management's confidence uh, in their outlook to continue growing that dividend that we think they've really focused on their core businesses that we have a lot of confidence in. Johnson Johnson has this ALK litigation. I happen to find it utterly frivolous, but it weighs over the stock. And so that's mm. given you about a 10 or $20 discount in the share price that you can buy one of the great, most dependable dividend growers in world history. And then finally, Gilead I brought up because I cannot believe how well they've performed with their pipeline of drugs post-COVID. They obviously did billions of dollars of revenue from what was called remdesivir, which was one of the viral therapeutics that was heavily used in COVID treatment. Even with those revenues falling off, they're continuing to exceed their revenue and earnings goals. They've made great uh, uh, progress with oncology treatments. So those are just three different names in different sectors that we like a lot. Right, and, and it's interesting that you pick these names uh, given uh, their 12-month performance and also their performance uh, year to date. I do want to get your thoughts in on uh, the tech names. I mean, for, uh, the large cap tech names are obviously doing well and are being seen as, as a defensive play. Chips are doing well. But w what, what would be your pecking order there? I mean, in terms of your preference, how would you allocate capital among big tech? Well, we wouldn't touch FANG or anything else that is trading at perverse and almost comical <coughs> valuations. And so when they have a good quarter like Q1, it adds to the valuation problem. We're obviously getting decimated last year, as most of the names did, uh, with Netflix and Facebook at one point being down at well over 70%. You would like to think that you got a more viable valuation, but even Amazon down 50% still stayed up north of a 40 times forward P.E. ratio. So, no, we want to buy things that have reasonable valuations because we're in a time of uncertainty, whether there's recession questions, Fed questions, geopolitical. This is just not a time to assume that you're going to get huge multiple expansion, which was really carrying big tech for years. Mm. We don't think the easy times are coming back. David, really quickly, I just want to go back to J&J &J for a second. If that $8.9 billion settlement is expected, do you think that that's an immediate catalyst to the upside for the stock? I do. I think most of the bad news that is potential is priced in, and J&J &J certainly has the capacity to take this thing all the way to a court that has some semblance of rule of law exists. So one way or the other, I think J&J &J prevails. But there is this path where it could take a while, and that could weigh on the valuation. J&J uh, &J has done very well through fr frivolous litigation in the past. And um, I think that this will be another case there. In the meantime, they continue across medical devices, this consumer uh, division that will be spun off, and then obviously pharmaceuticals. They continue to right. be an industry leader. Uh David, we have a minute to go before we hit a hard break. So very quickly on this one, are you talking, uh, is there chatter around, um, you know, tech breakup in the U.S., uh, given what's happened with Alibaba? Um, there is substantial talk about various elements of tech being restructured, but I do see the chatter about it being forced by Congress or forced by regulators coming down a bit. I think there was more concern a couple years ago that there would be something regulatory and it does appear that, you know, two years into a Biden administration, 
that that doesn't appear to be the path they're going. Um, frankly, some of the potential breakups could unlock value for some of those companies. I'm not sure that that would all be negative. But again, our argument against some of these companies, which are very profitable and in some cases very well run, our argument is simply valuation. They're too expensive. Got it. Thanks very much, David, for stopping by and giving us your thoughts. Uh, great two segments with you. Thank you very much.